There have been reports that we're having agents turned against us, that our sources uh, that we've been using are being killed at in extraordinary numbers. There was... Um, trying to remember what it came out it was a it was in the new york times got a julian barnes captured killed or compromises the name of the piece and they're saying that uh the cia uh, a top american counterintelligence officials uh, that they had warned every cia station and base around the world about troubling numbers of informants recruited from other countries to spy for us being captured or killed and i was thinking is that a leak but they were basically saying that we we kind of took our eye off the ball, and now our our adversaries in Russia, China, Iran, and Pakistan have been hunting down our sources and turning them. You know, I think one of the reasons that the withdrawal from Afghanistan was so traumatizing for a lot of people, it even caused the sectors of the media who literally haven't criticized a Democrat in five years to, you know, really unleash a lot of genuinely felt anger toward Biden, the Biden administration wasn't necessarily because the evacuation was poorly planned, although obviously it was. I don't think a poorly planned evacuation would generate that level of 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 of, of visceral anger. I think it really was a symbol of the reality that the United States, after being the world's sole, sole superpower for at least three decades since the fall of the Soviet Union is clearly starting to become weaker relative to these other large powers. And I actually thought about this for the first time the other day about January 6th. If you look at what happened on January 6th, President Trump convinced a large segment segment of the population, falsely in my view, but he convinced a large segment of the population that the election had been stolen that democracy was basically subverted, that he really won and the Democrats stole the election. And yet, despite that, on January 6th, you had maybe seven or 800 people extremely poorly organized, none of them brandishing a weapon, according to the FBI, not even centrally organized, show up at the Capitol to protest. They killed nobody. Four of them got killed. They didn't actually kill anybody. And then on the other side, you know, you're talking about the U.S. Capitol, right? Like we talked about 9-11. That was one of the targets of the 9-11 uh, terrorists. That was where the plane that landed in, in that crossed in Pennsylvania was mm -hmm. supposed to go. You would think that would be an incredibly fortified building. And yet they just marched in as though there was no security there. And it took hours to subdue them, even though most of them weren't even violent. So both sides of that equation, for me, kind of revealed this sort of physical weakness. You know, we have a population that is obese. We have a military that increasingly is about much more about social values than it is the traditional mm -hmm. military values. Um, and so I think what we're seeing is a country that has become a lot weaker in the areas where it had always been strongest. And the CIA, and we saw this with General Milley, you know, has lost focus on what its mission had always been. It still does a lot of pernicious things, but when you're training them to make videos about, you know, I'm the first Latina woman of my generation and using this kind of like woke language and mm. instilling those kinds of values into these institutions, they're going to lose their military agility and readiness when you have intelligence and military agencies in China, Russia, Iran, and lots of other countries focused on their traditional mission. I yes. think you're seeing that in a lot of ways. I'm like, we should focus le less on our intersectionality and more on our sources and methods, which apparently are not being well protected uh, overseas. Can we talk about January 6th for a minute? Because I, I, you know, I've spoken about this privately, but I was on my pal Dan Abrams show. Uh, he's got a show on News Nation now um, at, mm -hmm. in, in the evenings. And he was asking me, among other things, about my comment that the media has grossly overplayed what happened on January 6th. Not to excuse what happened on January 6th. I didn't like what happened on January 6th. There's plenty to condemn, condemn about what we saw that day. But it wasn't an insurrection. And the media said it was over and over. It, it was never an, ins an insurrection, legally or otherwise. And the FBI has confirmed that now. Um, the comparisons to 9-11 to saying that it was worse than 9-11. And Dan said, who said that? I was like, well, how long do you have? I could go down the list. You know, George Will, Matthew Dow, Joy Reid. I could I could go on. The, the, the White House correspondent for Huffington Post, on and on and on it goes. Um, but 
it's it's beyond that. It's the actual reporting of what happened that day and the painting of these people as these insurrectionist terrorists, none of whom have been charged with anything like that. Right. So if you where's the outrage right from the Democrats and the media, like where's the no one's been charged with the things you're telling us they did. It's it's trespass charges. It's petty Annie BS that they held people in solitary confinement on for a long time, unjustifiably. And the 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 one narrative that I know you've done great reporting on is what happened to Officer Brian Sicknick. And the media held on to the story that he was murdered by the Trump mob that day on Capitol Hill, even when they knew it wasn't true. They put it in the impeachment documents, even when they knew it wasn't true. And your your reporting on it has been so insightful because you sort of track it minute by minute by like the mo- his mom that night saying, don't say this. He yeah, I heard from him tonight, you know, like he. Just the 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 misreporting and the unwillingness to bend. It's all part of the same thing, Glenn, right? Like narratives, the commitment to them, the desire to bring down Trump or anybody associated with him. And still to this day, just to say it was bad. I don't like what happened on Capitol Hill at all. It was disgusting. Um, but you how dare you compare it to 9-11 is somehow controversial. I mean, nobody likes what happened at the Capitol. No one, you know, if you're an American citizen, you don't want to see mobs smashing windows and, you know, some of them had like some violent intent. Um, Most of them, I do think, were just there exercising their lawful right to protest and got carried away in this kind of like mob mentality. As we were talking about earlier, it can, you know, we're social animals. That kind of contagion can happen. It happened on a lot of Black Lives Matter and Antifa rallies over Mm -hmm. the summer as well when people went with the intention to peacefully protest and it turned violent and a lot of them became violent. I never saw that as an insurrection either, even though a lot of those protesters were violent as well. The problem, you know, if when when I went throughout 2020, the question always was, how is this media, the U.S. media that was failing before Trump and then found a savior in Trump? He saved most of those media outlets. What were they going to do in the likely scenario that he lost in 2020, as polls were showing? And I I gave dozens of interviews where I said what they're going to try and do is say that, well, Trump might be gone but the movement he left behind is an, poses an existential threat to American democracy because they have to keep people hooked with fear and terror and high levels of emotion in order to keep watching their programs. And that is what January 6th served to do. It made people, you know, it kept fear levels high. Um, it is justifying all kinds of new powers in these agencies. They gave $2 billion to the Capitol Police five months after they were chanting defund the police mm. in the street. Um, the thing that's amazing is, you know, this whole movement that erupted after 2020 was about excessive prosecution. I'm somebody who thinks that we put more citizens in our prisons than any other country in the world. I do think we overcharge crimes and put people into prison for longer than they should, especially for nonviolent crimes. And yet here you have judges, Obama appointed judges who are giving sentences longer than the prosecutors of the Justice Department are requesting and they're being applauded. And it all is because they believe that the Trump movement, as I was saying earlier, are terrorists. They're not people with whom Democrats and liberals have ideological disagreements. And to, you always need the maximalist narrative in order to keep those fear levels high and to justify all the powers that they want to use. The idea that 800, you know, Trump boomers from Facebook came close to overthrowing the most powerful and militarized government in the history of humanity is more preposterous than the idea that the Russians had invented some new supersonic weapon that they were deploying all over the world without anyone knowing about it. And yet, as you say, it's not just that people are asserting it, it's that you're not even allowed to question it or else you get accused of being, you know, an apologist for the insurrection or even a secret sympathizer of it.